Thanks for listening to the nice podcast. I am available to deliver keynote presentations and workshops for your company or for your conference. Reach out to me, davedelaneyspeaks.com or email me and we can talk. Now on with the show. As a business to business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives. 10 million are C-level executives. You'll also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B, and they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn is the social network that drives the most visits to my website from all the different articles and interactions that I do on LinkedIn. I have to tell you, LinkedIn is awesome. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash NPN. Terms and conditions apply. I worry on behalf of businesses, particularly now that everybody's talking about hybrid uh, working practices, you know, go, here's a laptop, go away and work at home. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you can hot desk when you come in. Well, you know, it's not going to. I can tell you, it's not going to last. We've already tried it once back in the late nineties. <laughs> it didn't work mm. for the very reason that businesses work, organizations work, because people meet face to face. They have to, and they kind of need to to make things work out well. They need to have these personalized relationships with each other, and you're not going to make those over the internet and you're not going to make those if you're sitting however nice your log cabin in the woods is uh you know at the end of the day most of these organizations depend on personalized relationships and if people aren't able to build up that sense of community in the workplace the organization or the business is going to suffer in the long run nice 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 with dave delaney Welcome to the nice podcast about communication, collaboration, and becoming better leaders. Today, I am chatting with evolutionary psychologist and former director of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology in the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University, Professor Robin Dunbar. Good day, sir. Hi, good Good morning from our point of view. Good- yeah, yes, that's right. That's right. Afternoon. Are you in, where are you today? In, in uh, the northwest of England, and it really is the afternoon here, but I guess it's morning for you. It is morning for me. Yes, I'm in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and I, I will I will say y'all possibly, but I also might say A a lot because I'm actually Canadian. Uh, ah, right. So I'm, I'm from Toronto originally. Right, yes. Very good. Yeah. I nearly, I nearly got a job there. Oh, no kidding. Where? Yeah, yeah. The University uh, of Toronto? Guelph, or? Guelph yeah. Ah. University of Guelph, yeah. Just nice. down the road. By yes. Canadian, by Canadian standards, literally just down the road. Right. <laughs> Yes, yes. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away. Absolutely. (laughs) So I do want to add that you are the author of multiple uh, best-selling books, and your latest is Friends, Understanding the Power of Our Most Important Relationships. And and this is something I've been really excited to talk to you about, something I've been exploring, uh, and and, you know, I think we're all exploring uh, friendships. So it's it's definitely something. So welcome uh, to the nice podcast. So I do want to start with my first question, which I always like to start with, which is, what is the nicest thing someone has done for you recently? My goodness, in lockdown. <laughs> in lockdown, no less. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think it must be uh, uh, my various offspring bringing their grandchildren, uh, sorry, my grandchildren, yes, uh, their children, uh, uh, to see us after a long gap um, as soon as they decently could, let's put it that way. Right. Yeah. We we're actually crossing the border, uh, this week, um, to go and actually we're, we're, 
well, we're going for my, my father's funeral, uh, unfortunately, but uh, we're also going to see my mom who I haven't seen since December, 2019. And, uh, so we are very excited. She, she too is uh British by the way. All right. Yes, she is. Uh, yeah. So she's been living in Canada since 1967. Uh, and, and right. still, uh, I, I have this theory, by the way, the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team, uh, hasn't won a Stanley Cup since 1967. So my guess is that if my mom ever leaves, they have a chance. It, it sounds like a good coincidence, causal coincidence. That's right. I that's right. Say, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so readers uh, of my book, New Business Networking, might be already, or hopefully they're already familiar with Dunbar's number. And I know you, you, you uh, probably. I hope you don't roll your eyes, but you might having to explain Dunbar's number yet one more time. But if you wouldn't mind, please, for our listeners who are not familiar with Dunbar's number, uh, would you mind sharing what that is? Yes, Dunbar's number is the rough limit on the number of personalized relationships you can hold at any one time. So this is friends and family uh, and in-laws, of course. Um, uh, and the number you can kind of manage and keep track of and, and keep up to date, reasonably up to date with, hmm. it tends to be the number of people we try and make an effort to contact at least once a year just to keep keep them in the loop. Mm -hmm. That's about 150. It varies between about 100 and maybe 250, depending on your personality Extroverts tend to have more, introverts fewer, perhaps. Uh, your sex, the girls tend to have more, the boys tend to have fewer. Hmm. Age, the youngsters have more, need I say it, the old ones have fewer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, my uh, I'll be celebrating my uh, 50th in April, and um, I'm feeling that now, and you mentioned it in the book, I'm certainly feeling that, that – uh, that sort of loneliness and separation and, you know, not having, I've, I've been in Nashville now for 15 years, but I'm very extroverted. And you talk about it in the book about how extroverts have many, many relationships, but they're, they're more fleeting where introverts are more focused on, on, you know, a, a smaller a select group of people. And, and in a way they, I feel like they build better relationships perhaps. Yeah. I, I, uh... I'm not sure necessarily whether one strategy is better than the other. I kind of tend to view them as mm. two different ways of solving the same problem of having people around to support you. And the difference seems to be that introverts are kind of more risk averse and that um, uh, they want to make sure that those friends they have really are going to stand by them and, and will kind of step up to the plate as and when their help is required, which of course is unpredictable. It, it, you never know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're very lucky it may never happen. But when it, you know, your life falls apart for some reason, that's the time you want them to step up to the plate. And I think introverts kind of go, well, I want to really make sure that uh, I've got a group of people to draw on. So they invest very heavily in them and therefore have fewer because our time is limited, of course. Yeah. Whereas I think extroverts tend to take the view that they kind of, their, their, their social confidence, if you like, uh, allows them to sort of, uh, if they get turned down by um, Jemima, that they can just go, well, never mind, I'll go and uh, uh, try Mary instead, and, uh, and they're happy to sort of whiz around. Therefore, they, they invest less in each person in order to have a wider circle of friendship, because the, you know, I suppose a wider circle of friendship gives you more choice. Mm. Um, you know, if, if, if somebody's busy, uh, uh, with some project and can't go and, uh, uh, engage with, in some social activity with you, go to the theater, have dinner, or go for a beer somewhere. Well, you know, somebody else will sure to be free. So, that, you know, that seems to be more their attitude. It's just a different, different way of really achieving the same objective of, of making sure that you've got sort of, uh, friends and family who, you know, support you when it's needed. Yeah. When I moved to Nashville, I co-founded a couple of networking events or founded a couple of networking events, events during, and, and a couple of conferences. And in doing that, um, met tons of people. Um, but, 
And, and actually, it was your book that made me think about this a little deeper and realize, you know, that I might have, uh, I might, I might have not been able to, fo- or not been able, but maybe I just failed to focus on on building some uh, <laughs> more solid relationships and rather have lots of of acquaintances, even. Right. Um, and that's, you know, obviously I have like, you know, my handful, my, my core few, uh, very close, you know, best friends. Um, and that's something you, you talk about. And that's, that's definitely that inner circle of Dunbar's number as yeah. well. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And as an extrovert too, like I work from home and have done for the last decade. So my wife's a school teacher and my kids are at school. So when they all come home now, my kids are teenagers. So it's, you know. They don't even want to talk to me anymore, sadly. <laughs> There's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Get get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they literally get home. They go to their rooms. They close their doors. Yep. Um, but then my wife gets home and she's like, uh, and she goes to the, her bedroom or the, our bedroom and she closes the door. And I'm like, ha, 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 like ready to play. Who wants to play? And nobody will talk to me. And I'm like, oh, it's sad trombone. Yep. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so. To that point, though, I mean, you talk, you know, and, and I've done research into loneliness because that's something I have found. I've, you know, uh, read a lot of Brene Brown's work and, and, uh, and just about this, this idea of, of feeling lonely. And, and I feel like almost during the pandemic, especially, this has been a time, you know, where, you know, we've always, especially as an extrovert, I've always been very mindful of introverts and trying my best to, to, uh, to, you know, uh, make them feel comfortable at events and so forth. But it's really, I think this time for extroverts to like have support networks. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> Probably true, actually, because I think it is true. You know, we've, we've all been under lockdown for, um, gosh, I, I guess we can barely remember for how long now it's been so long. Right. Um, but it, it, it very likely is. I mean, I've never looked at this, but I, I'm sort of, um, kind of guessing really that introverts cope better with uh, isolation as it were than extroverts will do extroverts want to be out and about and mm-hmm. as you say you know as soon as there's somebody through the door you want to play <laughs> <laughs> that's me man that's me in a nutshell right there yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, so, it's... yes so maybe you know i hadn't thought of it in these terms that you know you can see all sorts of consequences that are obvious as to how lockdown might affect different kinds of people in yeah. different ways but the one we haven't never thought about is actually personality in that sense so nice that's a good one Good. So I asked you a question you haven't yeah. been asked. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Cause in your book, you wrote, uh, and I love this, uh, in effect, extroverts behave like social butterflies flitting from one person to another, not devoting a great deal of time to any of them. And, and I was, as I was reading that, I was like, Oh God, that's me. Like he's totally <laughs> nailed me. And by the way, any naysayers, cause I know there have been naysayers about Dunbar's number, but honestly, just digging into your book, um, the amount of research you did for this book is astounding. Now, like you, you reference so many studies and, and it's, and all around the world too. I think it's quite fascinating that way, how, you know, we humans are uh, quite similar and it doesn't really matter where we are geographically speaking. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah. I think it's, I mean, obviously there are cultural differences in the details of how we, Hmm. um, individually behave, uh, you know, sort of uh, nodding the head um, uh, uh, for us uh, in, in the, at least in the Anglophone countries, put it this way, mm. uh, uh, is typically a, 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 an indication of assent, uh, you know, I agree with you, whereas in other cultures it can be the reverse or, you know, sort of Tibetans famously laugh uh, at, at funerals, which would be regarded as... <laughs> Very inappropriate uh, uh, to do right. here, um, and, and, but that's kind of a reflection of the fact, of course, in that particular case, that uh, well, actually, it is a happy occasion because yeah. the person has moved on to the next um, uh, reincarnation. So you know that's great. You know, so it's perfectly uh, a, a good thing to be to be happy. Um, but th- I think deep down on the basics such as the fact that everybody laughs, everybody nods and shakes their head uh, in social contexts. Um, everybody 
kind of feels the same. And I think the, the one study we've done that particularly bears on this has to do with uh, um, physical contact. So touch, we've become very conscious of the fact that touch is a, a really fundamental part of our the way we engage with close um, uh, friends and family, not just your intimates, but, you know, sort of um, the closer members out to, 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 to around about cousins, you know, you, you give them a hug when you meet them and you pat on the shoulder and stroke on the arm and all these kind of things. And this is really part, part of the same mechanism that primates use in grooming, social grooming, to, to create their social bonds with each other. Now, we've, we've studied that where you're allowed to touch where you're comfortable with other people touching you right around on your body up and down uh north to south and east to west um of europe you know from the british isles at one extreme to russia at the other and the Finns in the north to the italians in the south but also mm. in japan and um, across these sort of really in many ways quite different cultures Yes, there are some interesting differences. Of course, the Italians are more huggy, kissy yeah. than the British are. <laughs> but, <laughs> but by and large, uh, you know, the differences are, are quite minor, really. And, and even, you know, even including the Japanese then in this mix, we find that the places where you're allowed to touch other people depends very much on, on the closeness of the, the relationship. And that's why we end up you know, shaking hands with strangers because that's the one part of the body that's sort of at furthest remove, if you like. So yeah. I'm, I'm making a gesture here, but you're not coming any closer, mate. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, you're listening to The Nice Podcast with Dave Delaney. That's me. Visit futureforth.com to learn how we can transform the communication at your organization. And if you need a speaker for your next online event or your in-person conference, are we doing in-person conferences yet? Uh, soon, I hope. Uh, you can visit DaveDelaneySpeaks.com and uh, you'll learn more about working with me there. All right, let's get back to the show. But I, I mean, it is very striking. A lot of these deep sort of psychological components are quite clearly universal and, and and have their origins way back in our primate evolutionary past as it were. so yes but uh yeah you mentioned you mentioned um dunbar's number <laughs> <the> constant <laughs> attempts to prove it wrong and i sometimes i you know sort of most of the time i just sigh and go and find <laughs> something more interesting to do um but you know because it's just become like a religion you know it's ideological um, it, and, and I don't understand quite what the problem is. Um, mm. You know, uh, the usual run of the mill uh, uh, explanations or, or counter explanations are well, you know, I have a thousand friends on Facebook. Well, I'm sure you do. Um, but all you're doing is adding in people we would normally call acquaintances. You don't actually know most of those. Yeah. But I think the finest evidence, which I didn't know at the time I wrote the book, I've only just discovered the paper, although it was published in 2010, I think it was. Um, uh, it was a huge study of Facebook. So there are 61 million people's Facebook pages were looked at and, and the number of friends counted. And the average, believe it or not, is 149. <laughs> um, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes. The the naysayers will naysay, but, you know, they can just whatever. Yeah. They probably aren't going to have many yeah. friends anyway. Uh, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> if you're going to be like that, I mean, come on, people. Um, but to your point about touching, um, you know, and, and I've been always like I've, I've written before about like the power of hugs and high fives and handshakes and the fact yeah. that when you, you know, I, I'm an early adopter of social media, social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and so forth and the ones that disappeared over the years. Um, and and I did build some relationships on those platforms. However, it's really just the ones that I met in person when we finally met up in person at a tech conference typically. And we did actually like hug and high five and handshake or, you know, all or the have above a beer or, together. or have a beer together. Right. Exactly. Um, that brought us together. What do you think about, and I'm kind of riffing here, but what do you think about VR? Can, as it applies, like I think about this day and age right now where we are not, 
or I mean, I'm in Nashville. Just don't look at the news here because <laughs> it's a mess <laughs> of people partying in the streets and so oh, forth. No. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a nightmare. Uh, but, and for offend, they must all be extroverts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All the extroverts are going to just die out uh, in in the uh, in the pandemic. Um, but but considering the the pandemic and how we are not really touching like we did before, do you think there's some? Have there been studies in VR and how VR could possibly replace that by tricking our brains in into touch? I don't think so directly, but uh, the, there have been. I think people are conscious of the fact that touch is very important in this context. And mm. there have been lots of attempts clearly to um, kind of develop virtual reality touch. I, I've of, often said uh, as a challenge to the techies that if any of them can really genuinely develop uh, uh, algorithms that allow you to have engage in touch um, through through social media sites as opposed to virtual reality, hmm. then they'll probably get the no- next Nobel Peace Prize and probably be the first people to really deserve it for a long time, uh, simply because of the role that touch plays in in bonding our relationships. So, so if you like, our problem is our, our natural psychological mechanisms for creating. Uh, relationships is very small scale. It's essentially Dunbar's number, or maybe if you want to include the layer of acquaintances that you have beyond that, which takes you out to about 500 people, mm. that's really the limit. Um, and you know, there are a sight more than 500 people in the world today. <laughs> right. If we don't get them better uh, acquainted with each other and better engaged with each other, you know, we're probably in for some trouble in the future. But if you know, if we could, uh, if we could get them all partying on the streets, yes, uh, uh, together, um, then then things would be a lot better. But clearly, we can't. I mean, physically, we just can't do it. Never mind things like lockdown. But um, yeah. you just cannot put that number of people, um, uh, whatever it is, we are seven billion or something, all in the same place at the same time. And even if you could, you know, it would be like having an enormous. Uh, 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 line dance. Well, you know, at one end of the line dance. Who cares as to who's at the other end? It does, it's meaningless. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's, it's the ones near you that, that you are sort of engaging to. So, you know, digital technology ha- offers prospects, if you like. It has potential, clearly, from that point of view. And my worry would be if it becomes totally VR and you get submerged in a virtual world. Um, with a high genuine touch component of that kind, um, because clearly if you could get the technology right, you could exploit it in, in a VR context. And I, I, I would quite worry about that because I think there's only one way in which we really learn how to engage with other people and learn the skills we need to make the social world go around, indeed, therefore the political world go around. Mm. Uh, and that is my experience in the sandpit of life, face to face. You know, you, you know, these are the skills of diplomacy, um, essentially, knowing when to kind of calm somebody down when they're getting on their high horse about something and, and uh, uh, um, you know, ha- how to not manipulate them exactly, but how to manage uh, their their relationships with us, so that you know we we form a a, a cooperative uh, and, and mutually helpful bond, rather than ending up um, you know throwing beer bottles at each other, or what people <laughs> like to do on a Saturday night. <laughs> right. Um, you know. So you know, and I I would worry if if because though because touch is so intimate, it's so powerful, um, a trigger of of the psychological uh, mechanisms that underpin close relationships i would i it would become very um inducing to engage in it and you know you would be sucked away from uh real life into this artificial world because you wouldn't have to deal with people that um uh you know continue to yell and uh, upset you and what have you because you you could just live with these people who are always super kind to you well the only people, you know, who, who 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 live in the real world with lives like that are old-fashioned kind of emperors and kings of 
right. <laughs> centuries long past where yes. they had, you know, sort of thousands of courtiers uh, 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 dealing with their every whim and wish. But usually what happened is they ended up getting murdered by the courtiers. So it's not to be recommended, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost makes me, you know, the way you're talking about Facebook too, it makes me think, you know, when if early days of Facebook, um, for for you uh, younger uh, listeners who may not have used Facebook back in the earliest days, I think 2007 was when the public started using it, um, you could... Uh, uh, you could poke people. You could you could do a virtual poke by clicking a button like like a like button. You could poke them, and that might be coming all the way around now to like actually be able to virtually poke somebody using Oculus Rift. Or yeah, but to your point, I mean, I, yeah, I could see where where Facebook could end up. Yeah, people throwing virtual beer bottles at one another. <laughs> yeah, the, see, the, what what's sitting at the back of my mind here is it, mm. is uh, the fact that. The, the, the kind of neural mechanism or neuropsychological mechanism that underpins relationships, friendships, and so on, mm. all our uh, kind of more intimate relationships, is the um, endorphin system in the brain. The endorphins, as their name implies, are opioids. They're chemically quite closely related to morphine, except that the body is, you know, as a sort of natural. Uh, opiate we don't get addicted to them um you know we find them very rewarding right uh which is why we we you know keep coming back to engage with with friends and uh and do social stuff with them because it's triggering the endorphin system and reinforcing our our relationship mm. but we don't get addicted to them in the way you get addicted to things like morphine and, and opium and the like right and my worry is that if you have a kind of artificial vr type of physical contact um uh, environment to to retreat into if, when you get back home from uh, teaching all day. <laughs> yeah, um, you know it'll be a bit like uh, heavy drug taking, and and you yeah. know it's a one way downhill uh, path to nowhere, really. And you know, if it doesn't destroy you, it certainly destroys the kind of social environment within which you live. Yeah, I almost think of the movie Ready Player One or the book as well and, and sort of that depiction of the future where you're spending the bulk of your time in some sort of virtual world rather than interacting with one another in person yeah. and having a pint or something like that. And, and to that point, by the way, um, I lived – so I lived in Ireland for a few years. That's actually how I ended up living in Nashville, Tennessee. I met my wife in Galway, Ireland, and uh, and I lived in London for a while and we lived in Edinburgh um, for a while, for about a year as well. And, and, and having a mom who's British and I say mom, <laughs> cause that's what she is. Um, you, you know, I've grown up with pub life and, and going to bars and hanging out with friends and that's where we would meet. And I'm not a religious person, so I've never really had like church to go to. And right. especially living in the South, that is where, where people meet. That is where they find their communities. And I'm curious, like what your thoughts are. And you, you wrote about that a lot in the book. Actually, you mentioned, I, I would have to do a word check on how many times you mentioned pub, but. Every time you read, every time you said, I felt like it should be a drinking game. I should have a, have a sip when I read it. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I miss, I miss pub life. Like oh. it, it's just, it's almost, it's almost frowned upon in the States and in Canada to some extent as well. Certainly in Toronto, like more because it's more similar to, to the U S in that way where, right. you know, to get together for pints after work is just kind of frowned upon. What are you, an alcoholic? Yeah. Uh, you know, any thoughts about pub life and, and maybe not maybe finding community and finding friends, especially for older folks trying to, to find new friends. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, if you like sort of, I don't know, symptomatic of the much more general problem of how you go about finding friends. Well, you know, when you're young, um, you know, teenager and 20 uh, somethings, most of your life is, Cocoon, relatively well cocooned for you in the sense that you're sort of embedded into a local community where people introduce you or you know you know where the places to go are to to meet up with people and of course the problem that we seem to be having in great measure really in many ways uh, is that the sort of mid-20s onwards where that decade from 25 to 35 perhaps where people have got their first job 
after graduation in a city they know nobody in except mm. people at work and they don't know where to go uh, that's you know a safe and b appropriate for the kinds of people they would like to make friends with you know i think there's a that, that big pandemic of loneliness in that age group that's been building for the last all oh, maybe 10 years but I think the other end of life also has the same problem because of course you know sort of uh, Friends move on. There's a constant turnover of friends at any age, if it comes to that. But you know, later in life, friends move on or, or they die, and the older folk don't have the energy and and motivation to get up and go to find new friends to fill those slots. And even if they do, they kind of haven't been to you know where do you go? Uh, you know, mm. they lost. They last went to clubs. You know, sort of fifty years. <laughs> yeah. you know, right. Uh, you, don't, you, you know, if you turn up to a sort of uh, uh, a, a young person's, dare I say, it, yeah. person's <laughs> venue, you yeah. know, the big bulky bouncer on the door is going to say, "On your way, chum." <laughs> <laughs> Creepy old man. <laughs> we, we, we don't want folk like you in here. Right, um, right. You know, so where, where do you go? And if you don't have somewhere like a church community or a you know maybe you belong to a, a bridge club or or a book reading club or whatever mm. that you can go and meet people then then you're into this really rapid downward wood spiral i think and I, um and that's what seems to happen you know sort of uh, this is why you get this sort of negative decline in um the size of people's social networks from about the mid 20s when it hits its sort of maximum um, down into old age, and of course, if, you know, quite literally, if you live long enough, um, your social world is reduced, you know, to you know one or two people maybe that, that you can think of as as, as close uh, friends, and the rest are by and large strangers. Hmm. So uh, there is the problem generally, I think, is providing suitable. Sp- Spaces or, or places where people can go, and one of the things which the pub did, as indeed you know, it's not just pubs. You know, it's just the cafe bars all over southern Europe, um, uh, 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 and the beer kellers, I suppose, in in in, in northern Europe. Sure, uh, you know, is they provided a place where you went as a regular, and we we uh, were involved in a big study, national study of of. Uh, um, the use of, of pubs from this point of view. And we were interested in comparing the old style community pub where everybody knows everybody else, you know, the clientele, you know, the bar staff and, and, you know, it's sort of uh, a welcoming atmosphere from that point of view um, where you can go and you can be sure to meet somebody and sit and have a chat with them uh, 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 and, and, and sort of buck yourself up and compared with the kind of, uh, kind of dr- drinking dens on the high streets that, that yeah. have become increasingly common, wh- whose entire purpose seems to be to shift people through as fast as possible with as much drink as possible. So right. they're noisy, you can't have a conversation, um, and everybody's basically there just to get drunk, whereas the kind of traditional pub, by and large, um, you know, is is somewhere you can go and sit in a corner and, and, and have a quiet chat with with, with you know, sort of three or four of your friends, yeah. Um, you know, and set the world to rights and and all these kinds of things, and that uh, allow you to come away at the end of the evening feeling buoyed up and and refreshed. Yeah, not not just by the uh, drinks that reach the parts that nothing else can reach, but right. uh, um, <laughs> sort of by the the companionship uh, 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 that 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 you've been able to engage in. And those kind of pubs, you know, have been dying. Uh, somewhat uh, rapidly in Britain anyway, and uh, probably Ireland as well, actually, simply because of the availability of cheap take-home alcohol from supermarkets or cheaper take-home alcohol, because, yeah, you know, and, and, and the sort of noisy um, uh, main, main thoroughfare, main street uh, drinking dens, which are catering to a very different kind of clientele who, who, who largely seem yeah. to be just interested in getting completely out of their heads on it but uh, and i think that's a great shame really because that risks increasing isolation if you, when you when you had as it were your local pub on 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 the village green 
you you know you know that you know you can always go there if you're living alone, a widower, a widow, or whatever. Uh, you could always go down to the pub on a Friday night or whatever it may be, Saturday, uh, Sunday lunchtime or, or whatever. And there yeah. would be people there to, 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 who would have a chat with you and, uh, you know, pass the time of day and, and be companionable, companionable. And, you know, you would occasionally, you would meet new people you've never met before. And here's an opportunity to make new friends. And of course, yeah. importantly, in the contemporary world, I think you met a cross section of the world, at least the world as represented by the village, hmm. uh, a cross section of the age, uh, you know, from young to old, a cross section of political views, cross section of views on anything you care to, to, to imagine. So you could sit down, you could have a discussion and a debate. Yeah. But because everybody knew it, knew each other, never got out of hand, and you could you know, resolve the debate by some argument and discussion and so on, but it never got uh, too heated. Right. Sense. Whereas I think when, you know, in this sort of anonymity of big cities, as we have them now, it's far too easy for people to sink into a kind of uh, echo chamber environment where, of course, online particularly so, uh, you know, where you mm. only associate with people who think like you, uh, and almost by definition of your age, um, you, don't, you don't get a chance to meet people from other cultures, other um, uh, Groups with different views uh, hmm. and so on, and, and that that is not a good recipe for community cohesion. I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember in your book you wrote about uh, Canberra, which is the campaign for real ale. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I did make a note of that actually because it stood out. I, I did want to investigate that myself, and it's sad to hear uh, that that you know, pubs are, are, you know, shutting down in, in the, in the UK and Ireland compared to, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the confusion of a pub, a pub or a bar in, in the U S and I will include Canada in this to an extent where like for me to go to a pub here, like there's a, there's bloody TVs everywhere you look oh, okay. and it's so, and I have absolutely no interest yeah. in sports at all. And yet it'll still be distracting and I still can't yes. focus on the person I'm speaking with. And in yeah. fact, I actually mentioned this on Facebook years ago and, um, a lot of friends chimed in and actually made comments. People that were Americans that lived here that chimed in, gosh, I would go to a, a bar more often without TVs uh, or, you know, bring out the TV just like the one I used to regular in Toronto. They would bring out the TV just for like sporting events, yeah. you know, big ones, not for yeah. every bloody game under the sun. Um, so yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you on that. And that the, the other thing too is, is, the lack of really understanding pub culture in the U.S. because of the 21-year-old drinking age, which is, you know, crazy to me yeah. that... And don't forget know. prohibition. There's a long history of right. this in the U.S. So it's been a problem there. I mean, to be fair, you know, I mean, the, the, in the ni late 19th century, uh, mid-19th century, you know, Upstanding citizens were seriously worried about the, the level of uh, alcohol drunkenness yeah. um, in in the U, uh, U.S. at the time. I suppose as they were in, in Britain too. So you had the temperance movements arising. Yeah. Um, and, and to some extent, we still have that. And and uh, in Northern Europe, I mean, it does seem to be a particular problem with Northern Europe. And in fact, it's it's so well known. That the, uh, uh historically, that even the Romans, when they came up to Northern Europe, were deeply shocked <laughs> by the fact that these barbarians up there, <laughs> you know, just went out and got absolutely smashed. Right. Uh, drinking, drinking alcoholic <laughs> drinks. You know, they didn't drink their, sip their wine genteelly in the Mediterranean way. And, yeah. you know, the Normans, the Normans, when they arrived here in, 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 in England in 1066, were also absolutely appalled because being French, I mean, okay, you know, they were three generations off being Norwegians, but never <laughs> mind. They'd learned to be French. And so they sipped their wine genteely and they were absolutely deeply shocked and, uh, by the Anglo Saxons who had this Northern European drinking culture. <laughs> it was just, you know, pour it down as fast as you can right. until you can't stand up. And and I do find this bizarre, really. Um, uh, not least, the fact that, yeah. uh, you know, long before I get anywhere close to that, I'm feeling quite ill and don't want to drink right, right. any more of this stuff. You yeah. know, so, 
so you pace yourself. Uh, um, yeah. But, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's the same old story, I guess. It's a little of, a little of everything is good for you. The problem is uh, have too much of it. And, and, of course, it poisons you just the same as salt poisons you, sugar poisons you, yep. oxygen poisons you, water <laughs> poisons you right. if you have too much of it. You know, everything so. in moderation. Yeah, everything in moderation. It, and, you know, it, it, it's somehow creating the culture that, um, has that view, and I think the problem here in 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 Britain anyway has been um, that back in the nineteenth century, on the whole, uh, you know, people didn't have a lot of money, so they would well well into probably you know as late as the mid twentieth century, Second World War, you know, people would go to the their village pub and they'd sit all night wrapped around a pint of beer, yes, because they, that's all they could afford, you know. Right. Um, and of course, you know we're so much wealthier now. You know we can afford to, um, you know, apparently drink you know, <laughs> large magnums of very expensive champagne instead. Right. Well, the first yeah. <laughs> the fir- well, the first flat I had in in 1998 when I moved to Galway in Ireland uh, was right above a pub, and we right. had w- we I had three flatmates, and we shared one space heater between us. It was like with Nail and I, if you ever saw that amazing right. yes, film. Yes. Yeah, it was kind of like that kind of uh, setting, um, and so of course we would frequent the pub uh, because they had like a fireplace, and you know we could go down for there and warm up, and yeah, yeah probably have a couple pints while we're there. But and and to our American listeners, then, uh, which I think is most of you, um, I do want to point out that on the old show Cheers, they never did roll. You never saw like Cliff or Norm get hammered and you never saw them get rolled out right out of the out of the pub. So eh, maybe maybe there's there's food for that there. Um, and, and by the way, it's been interesting to see not to not to talk too much about booze here, but it is. I quit drinking about a year and a half ago and there are all these amazing micro brews now producing non-alcoholic yeah. beers. And so I can yeah. go out with friends now and have these half decent, pretty good non-alcoholic beers, which, um, I find, uh, yeah, it's just a, a great way to do it. But as far as like pubs being the, this sort of in-person social network, um, in fact, the actual, the first presentation I ever did about social media, I do a lot of speaking, uh, the first one, I actually compared different social networks to pubs in Galway. <laughs> to explain there about <laughs> yeah yeah uh, myspace was the the russian dub <laughs> if you've ever been um and it, this got me thinking about an article i read about years ago about how um i've always been like mcdonald's you know eh. <laughs> like when i was a kid sure i love mcdonald's but then you get older and you're like oh mcdonald's is kind of crap but um mcdonald's in rural especially in rural communities in the u.s you always see elder or older people kind of um, in groups there and McDonald's have become these community centers right. where um, especially older folks go and meet up. So they've sort of become this pub uh, in a weird way. And, and I don't know if you've ever read about that, but it's, I found that really interesting. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we don't really in Britain and I guess probably the same is true in either of the North American uh, nations, as they say, mm. um, we don't really have a kind of cafe culture as such. Mm. But you know, the equivalent of the pub in the southern continent, certainly in Spain, where I've actually kind of more familiar with it, uh, seen it in action, if you like. You know, it's 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 the the little uh, cafe bar that you know you go up there and and your friends will turn up. You might go and visit two or three sure. up and down the road, but you know you'll you'll be sure to find uh, you know three or four of your friends up there also having a quiet glass of wine of a of a Sunday after uh, uh, morning uh, uh, lunchtime mm. uh, or what whatever um, and I think they they function in 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 very much that sort of um, little local community way that, that the traditional pub did yeah um, in in Britain yeah it's interesting I'd be curious. I, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have. To, I have. To, I was just going to say. It always reminds me of. Um, uh, it's, there was a photograph that you used to see quite a lot uh, in sort of magazines and, and newspapers, I, I guess. But the, a, a, a photograph of two old, probably Greek men, sitting outside in the sunshine outside a taverna, either side of a table. And, you know, between between them, there were just uh, their two coffees or their two uh, glasses of ouzo or whatever. But uh, uh, you know, they would obviously just be 
taking a sip of, uh, of their drink from time to time, but absolutely saying nothing, just sitting there in silence. And, and yes, my pitch on that is this is two two men bonding. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is the way. This is the way guys do it. <laughs> right. Right. Conversation is not really relevant. It's that you are just there communing, <laughs> communing yeah. over a, over a glass of something. Yeah, I think I think you're on to something there too. Um, one thing with work, and I do want to talk about work here, and maybe even co working spaces, especially in the in the U.S. and Canada too. Um, but what about the workplace? Being that connection point for people who may be new to a city, they might have moved there for that job specifically. And, and does the workplace, uh, in a way, I mean, we spend, you know, there's always, uh, quotes about how we live, you know, we spend more time with our coworkers than we do with our families often. Um, has the workplace maybe replaced in a way the, not necessarily just the pub, but, but, become sort of that social place where people can connect and meet new people and, and ultimately have friends. Oh, I, I think it very much has. And particularly for that 20 something age group on their first, effectively their first job away from home, uh, you know, post-graduation hmm. university, they've been thrown into a kind of ready-made community, you know, in the fraternity dorm or, or whatever it may be that the, the, you know, degree uh, classes that they sit in they 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 have the opportunity to meet people and of course there's all the kind of clubs and associations there for them to engage in and suddenly they're often you know the big city the other side of the continent and, and they know nobody from nothing right and the only people the only place they have to meet people which is kind of you know guaranteed to be you know safe and secure and all those kind of things that we worry about is the workplace that, that there's an interesting question as to whether you want to have your social life entirely built around um, uh, your workplace uh, or the people you work with, because that means you've got nowhere to retreat to if you fall out with them. Right? Yeah. You know, there's some arguments for, for having your 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 friendship circles at home. Then at least you can retreat to, to yeah. sanity in the workplace if if you start to fall out. But on the other hand, I mean, it's <clears throat> it is the case that smaller um, companies, smaller businesses, tend to function much more as social environments. Well, no, let's back up uh, one step here and say that any workplace, any business, any organisation, whether it's a school or a, a hospital or a government department or a you know business in the in the usual sense or a factory. It's a social environment. It works only because people interact with each other mm. and do favors for each other and, and uh, help each other out and collaborate over you know some big project, per, you know, whatever the purpose of the organization is. So they are, workplaces are intensely social environments, so it's perfectly reasonable to you know, develop friendships with, with um, the people you work there, and that's probably important for the business. You know, if you... It, you know, if your 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 workforce are uh, all friends with each other, they'll do favors for each other and and get the big job done much more efficiently than if they, you know, uh, just glare at each other across the corridors and, and and won't talk to each other and won't communicate with each other. Um, <clears throat> but there's a tendency for that kind of siloization, I guess, echo chamber effect, to arise more and more easily as the organization gets bigger so you know people are less likely to have friends at work uh, among their their workmates uh, in bigger organizations bigger businesses than in s small family sized businesses as it were so uh, there's a kind of cutoff point somewhere around about 150 to 200 where mm. where this there appears to be a real flip as it were from you know, everybody in the workplace treats each other as family to uh, everybody in the workplace can't wait to get home and, and get away from the place because right. all their friends are at home. Um, you know, but, I, you know, I worry that I worry on behalf of businesses, particularly now that everybody's talking about hybrid uh, working practices, you know, go, here's a laptop, go away and work at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you can hot desk when you come in. Well, you know, 
it's not going to, I can tell you it's not going to last. We've already tried it once back in the late 90s. <laughs> it didn't work mm. for the very reason that businesses work, organizations work, because people meet face to face. They have to, and they kind of need to, to make things work out well. They need to have these personalized relationships with each other. And you're not going to make those over the internet, and you're not going to make those if you're sitting, however nice your log cabin in the woods is, mm. uh, that you work from at home, um, and you know how, avoiding the long commute into work on a noisy uh, transit system, or uh, um, you know the fact that you can take the kids to school and collect them uh, at lunchtime, and, and or have a game of golf at lunchtime, right? Right, right. And all these kind of things that that people immediately think of as the you know, benefits of uh, working from home. Um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, most of these organizations depend on personalized relationships. And if people aren't able to build up that sense of community in the workplace, the organization or the business is going to suffer in the long run. So, uh, and that seems to have been what happened last time, that, that um, you know, this, is, this wasn't, uh, triggered by any great pandemic or anything. It was just that the big uh, multinationals with their massive great headquarters in London and Toronto and New York and places suddenly figured that uh, they could save themselves a lot of money by uh, sending their staff out to, to their country cottages. Hmm. And then they could sell off this enormously expensive piece of uh, real estate in the city center and just have some you know small uh, place on, on you know less expensive land, right? And it didn't last. You know, they eventually came back into their their big city 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 center states because they you know people need to work, and it, you know you can't do that if you um uh you know you, it's all just kind of hot desking because it just becomes too transient. And it just reminds me actually of a, um, a talk I heard from. Um, uh, a couple of guys who were involved with trying to manage the exactly this kind of thing for one of the massive multinationals some years ago, and uh, mm. they'd um, uh, what they'd done was condense their headquarters from some scattered places, to, you know, sort of distributed all over uh, a county-wide area, so sort of fifty miles apart. Um, put them on a brand new campus and they built this beautiful stuff and they had shops and gyms and Michelin star restaurants and all sorts of nice attractions. Yeah. And they said to everybody, here's a laptop, go home. You can hot desk when you came in, you know, and they thought the trouble they were going to have, uh, I spent, put a lot of effort into kind of working through this two year lead in time, talking to people. And they thought that the group they were going to have real trouble with was the older generation who are going to say, what do you mean? I can't have my, you know, plush office with a, Six inch pile carpet, <laughs> right, right, cabinet in the corner, and all this kind of thing. But uh, uh, and the young ones would jump at it, and they they said it was just completely the reverse. They were just not completely sideways because it was so unexpected. The old guys said, "Oh, <laughs> give me three laptops. I'm on I'm on my yeah, way." Right. And the 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 youngsters all said, "What do you mean? We come into work to see our friends." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, we're going to end up with no social life at all if if you send us home. So, so in a way, warned, be warned. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can I can see that too. And this is this is something I do with with uh, you know I work with kind of fast growing technology companies typically, and I help them right. kind of overcome this and and improve retention. And and that is exactly what you're saying too. Is you know, I, I, you know, as this happens, um, it, as people become disconnected at work because they're not there in person, retention is going to, is, is going to be affected by that. Because yeah, if you don't have friends, friends to see at work, then why go to that work when you, somebody offers you 10 or 20, 30,000 pounds or dollars net extra, then you're going to go with that one. Yes. Yes. And I, there was, there was a, 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 a big survey. I, I think it's part of a regular survey that one of the big pollsters mm. uh, has been doing some years. And they came up with this very clear result in the last decade or so. And they asked people, well, you know, would you prefer to work uh, where you are? If, you know, if, if it was a sort of more engaging environment and you felt you kind of belonged more, or would you rather, would you, you know, prefer to, take a, an extra $50,000 a year 
uh, to move to to to, to somewhere else, and uh, and consist something like three quarters of people have said, look, it's the I'd rather get less money and have a good in you know kind of social environment, not necessarily social in the sense that um, you know I'm just uh, working with all my friends and nobody else, but that mm. you know, the, the kind of context in which you're working is more more human. Let's put it that way, more human and social. And yeah. Social. People engaged more with each other, so we do we do value uh, in, in an important way. In fact, value this this sense of being able to immerse ourselves in a in a community. Is there something that businesses like let's let's assume we're past the pandemic? Hopefully, um, what what do you envision businesses can do to help encourage their their people to to come back? But not only that, to also uh, encourage them to connect with one another, you know, to take some, some breaks or to, you know, I know a lot of businesses now have sort of, uh, they've got like pool tables and they, you know, they've got kind of leisure sort of cool. things, uh, installed. I almost think that, that, that lunch tables need to be configured in fours based on what you talked about in your book. Um, uh, how, you know, dinner parties and sitting with right. fours. Right. I, I love that. And I, that totally resonated with me. Um, but what are your, th- what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, paradoxically, I think in that sort of context, um, big refectory tables is probably better than fours. In other words, mm. you kind of don't know who you're going to be sitting next to, but actually you're forced to, if, if you sit in fours, I think this is the problem with pubs. Uh, you know, a lot of the pubs in Britain, because of, you know, declining um, revenue from alcohol sales as people have not been going, mm. have switched over to providing food and becoming kind of, restaurant stroke pubs and of course what happens there is people come in twos and fours and sit in twos and fours and don't talk to anybody else ah. whereas if you go to a traditional pub uh, you might sit down for a while but you wander up to the bar and you have a chat with somebody on the way and you see somebody on the far side of the pub and wander over and sit down by them or uh, you just get talking casually to somebody in passing and, and you know if you constrain people to sit in at tables that kind of thing doesn't happen. So mm. I actually think that if you want people to engage, then big refectory, refectory tables where little groups of four sit next to each other and then casually uh, start up a conversation with, with the folks next door is probably the way to do it. But this is a big question because I, you know, I know lots of, uh, you know, the, the kind of Silicon Valley folk have been way ahead of the game in, in, in kind of developing these kind of, uh, you know, facilities, you know, sort of quiet corners and pet, pet corners and, you know, pool tables and uh, coffee places and donut places, yeah. and these kind of things to, to, to provide places to, to mix. But, but they, my impression is they're hugely underused uh, um, compared to what the thinking was behind. I think there is a sense in which, um, you know, People have to be not exactly made to interact with them. That would sound too much like social engineering. Right. Uh, but, but the kinds of things that work in that context really are more large scale um, activities. So having things like choirs seem to work extremely well where this has been done. People, um, you know, sort of are hammering on the door usually to join once they realize um, that there are choirs I, mean, I don't mean you know sort of professional standard choirs singing the hallelujah chorus or anything like that <laughs> you know, community singing around the campfire basically yeah and i know where that's been done they have created you know a completely different atmosphere um in of you know sense of cooperation and and, and getting on uh with with the people in the that you work with in, in the organization Mm. Um, and and as you know, cause pe- not only you know, singing releases endorphins. We we refer to it as the icebreaker effect. You can turn complete strangers into people who feel they've known each other since birth, and are telling each other all their <laughs> life secrets after just an hour of community singing. Huh. Um, uh, and, and I don't know anything uh, else that 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 can e- so easily be done that will have the same effect. Uh, just electric and it's because it kicks in the endorphin system it probably accounts for the uh, it probably accounts for the success of karaoke bars too yes yes 
<laughs> Good, heaven for fend, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> trust me, I went I went to a karaoke bar when I moved to Nashville, and I was going to do something silly and real because I'm terrible, and I realized like everybody in there was a gifted singer because it's yeah. Nashville Music City, exactly. right? Everybody is a songwriter and, a, and an yeah. artist here, so um, yeah, yeah. So I quietly I, opted out. Yeah, I mean, that's the important thing here is literally community singing. You know, so it, it's you want everybody engaged and with with no kind of prima donnas as it were right um, uh, um showing off their uh, you know their beautiful voices it's it's it's, it's you know dancing does the same I mean, you, well you know you'll know from your time in edinburgh and ireland uh, you know uh, uh, scottish country dancing mm. and irish country dancing and of course square dancing in in the u.s which derives from that it yeah. is hugely social and it's you know if you have a a, a, a those those kind of dances, um, because you've got sets of couples uh, dancing together, it, you know, everybody ends up falling over, of course, and, yeah. and laughing at each other, and and that releases the tension, and everybody feels, uh, unless of course you happen to be with the um, the national uh, dance uh, <laughs> who are absolutely outraged by your appalling right. lack of knowledge. But you know, if it's a, 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 a casual Saturday evening um uh square dance you know everybody has enormous fun and and they kind of end up uh talking to each other and, and making friends and so on so I love that. these kinds of activities you know seem to be the best ones to do the the, the other one i'm i i've heard about uh, is sab miller the south huge south african-american conglomerate so that that's miller of miller light Mm. Uh, in the U.S. and um, South African breweries, SAB, um, who, who, who brought together, and, and what they had in their um, all their um, uh, headquarters buildings, and I suppose in the factories too, the breweries where they're doing it, but all their kind of management buildings was a pub right at the centre, and people went down there for you know a drink after work on their way home, and um, you know apparently it created a very very um, friendly, uh, happy, engaged, um, cooperative environment among the staff, you know, of a kind that, yeah. that, that allowed them to go go from being almost nothing to to one of the most uh, outstanding performing companies in the you know sort of uh, London Stock Exchange. Uh, I think they were uh, based on. Um, and highly desirable, you know, for, for investors. And a lot of that came from this, this sense of engagement that the staff had. And there are other examples of this. You know, yeah. you point to Gore-Tex, who, who, who have this unusual structure where no unit of theirs, no factory unit, no organizational unit, has more than an absolute maximum, I think, is 200 people. It's, it, the aim was 150 people. Mm. And that meant it was a little little community. So, you know, instead of, you know, when they increased in size as they became more and more popular, and remember, you know, we're all probably wearing Gore-Tex somewhere. Yes. If not in our clothes, in, in, in our <laughs> boots <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, these days. And in fact, it was there apparently in the, the, the space suits the men uh, had on when they landed mm. on the moon. You know, it's this hugely yeah. successful company. Um, but it, it has this sort of family uh, uh, sense to it because of these, the, the way they've structured. So, you know, when, you know, as it became uh, more in demand and, and, and they were requiring more and more production space, instead of it just increasing the size of the factory, which is what everybody tends to do, they would just build a completely new factory on the parking lot next door. So you ended up with two small factories, mm. but your volume output was now as required, but uh, each factory, you know, was entirely self-contained, uh, ran itself, ain't had its own objectives. Of course, you know, the board was kind of uh, deciding, you know, how, what the outputs had to be for sure. each factory and where they were targeted at. But yeah. each factory, you know, was entirely up to them, and they still operate on that uh, system. You know, it's uh, that's great. Back, you know, fifty years later, um, uh, they're still one of the most um, successful. Um, you know, small, small, medium-sized, I suppose you'd call it, mm. um, companies there is. 
I love that. And that's such a good example of how a company can, can use Dunbar's number in, in, yes. in developing this. Yes, so I, very, I always deeply regret that, that Willard Gore discovered this before I even thought of it. <laughs> well, we don't have to, I'll edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> all right. So we got to, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to move on to the lightning okay. round very quickly. Complete this sentence. Nice guys and gals finish. Ah, first. Excellent. What's a nice book you recommend to the nice makers? Uh, let's see. Um, I, I, actually, I would kind of recommend, just for a change, uh, a book called The Life of Dad, uh, as in Father, D-A-D, yes. by Anna Machin, which is uh, a glimpse into fatherhood, really. Um, and, and, and all the ups and downs and, and psychology and what have you. And it's just a, a, a left field book. You don't often see these because, of course, everybody yeah. tends to focus on mum. Yeah. Um, and, and somewhere hovering in, in the background, of course, is, uh, is dad. So animation has done this very fine little book on the life of dad. I love it. And as a, a father of two teenagers, I'm definitely going to check that out. All right. I can use all the help I can get. Uh, how is Robin Dunbar nice to himself? Uh, uh, I, uh, to be able to sit down and listen to uh, some uh, uh, medieval music, that that's uh, particularly medieval church music. I just find that uh, extremely relaxing. Interesting. My dad loved uh, Gregorian chants, Absolutely. but I think I think it's because yeah. he was a he was a former, obviously former uh, Catholic priest. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> so yeah. a long time, yeah. obviously, it's against but the rules. You know, once you, I mean, that stuff is so soporific. It has all the hallmarks of Buddhist chanting, and, mm. and you know, you see it in many different. But it really is unbelievably calming, and in, in you know, the cares of the world drop away from you. Yeah. Um, but there, and there are other, you know, one can point to, um, uh, many other kind of examples of the same qualities in, in music in, in different genres. Actually, I'm thinking of Us and Them by, um, uh, um, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Indeed. Yes. Uh, great song. You know, which has that same kind of quiet motion up and down, uh, rhythmic style of, of Gregorian chant. Mm. Yeah, that's a great... Words of Love by uh, uh, Buddy Holly is the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, and good messages in those, uh, those and of two, course, those yes, two course, songs, too. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, okay. One doesn't, need to, one doesn't need to understand Gregorian chant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, the, for that one, I have no idea. I can't, I can't comment there. Yeah. Uh, so if you had a billboard, what would it say? Ah, uh, Goodness me. Um, uh, make friends and live longer. I love that. And I love that. And that is a great note to end on. How can people get to uh, learn more about you and get in contact and that kind of thing? Uh, well, I guess uh, the book Friends that you mentioned uh, uh, um, at the beginning is uh, the place to start because that kind of summarizes 25 years or 30 years even of research that we've done in my research group over the years, um, which is, I suppose, why it commented how extensive it was. It is 30 years worth of, of very concentrated work. Mm. That's a good place to start. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, I do have a website, but it's my university website. And it probably doesn't tell, tell you very much, but um, um, uh, they can always find me uh, through that if they want to contact. That's great. Thank you. And and I do highly recommend the book. I, I really did uh, love it. And for everybody listening too, um, you know, when you read the book, make sure you leave a review because that's like the nicest thing you can do for an author. And it's something that I am working on right now for yours, but um, make sure you write a review for your favorite authors because that helps feed uh, uh, Amazon's algorithm or wherever uh, you've written that review. And that helps others discover the book because it's an important one, I think. Um, and I, I I really did enjoy it as I enjoyed this conversation with you. So thank you again for, for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the nice podcast. I would love to include your voice on the show. 
you have comments or questions regarding this episode or any episode, whether you might have some nice communications tips of your own, visit friend.nicepodcast.co. There, you can record an audio comment, and I expect you'll hear it on an upcoming episode. Theme song is Little Jane May, and the end song is Funny Feeling by Alistair Crystal at alistaircrystal.ca. And we'll see you next time. Be nice. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Jamie Lieberman hosts a great podcast called the UnBusiness Podcast. Jamie, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. The UnBusiness Podcast provides interviews with real-life entrepreneurs to talk about their struggles, their strategies, and how they have had success and what they've done in the face of failure. It is a real-life look at what it means to own your own business and gives you real takeaways on how you can make yours better. Awesome. Where can people subscribe? Go to hashtag-legal.com backslash podcasts. Find the show at marketingpodcasts.net or search for the Unbusiness Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe.